Hello again, I'm Martin Heine and today I would like to talk about one of the most important subjects to wrap your head around in all of audio. This thing is one of the major reasons for sound problems from bad microphone placement, in a bad mix, in a playback system, as a result of latency, even just as an acoustic phenomenon without any technology involved whatsoever. This thing is worse and less fixable than the wrong microphone, the noise floor, affordable converters, distortions, a bad stereo image and many other things that people will worry about. Worry about this. I'm talking, of course, about comb filtering. First of all, let's see what it even is. I have briefly touched on the subject before in this video about the audio signal. I would really recommend that video for everyone to solidify their basic understanding of the subject. Basics are always the most important thing and if any terminology in this video is unclear to you, pause, go to that other video and then continue here afterwards, please. Okay, so what we're looking at here is what happens when an audio signal regardless of whether it's voltage, digital or sound pressure in the air, is colliding with a delayed copy or close approximation of itself. So we have a signal and its copy, but there's a shift in time. There's a plethora of situations where this happens and we'll get into them. But for the time being, let's look at what happens. We may remember that if two signals added together are the same and they are in time, then there is constructive interference. So if two identical signals are added together, the sound pressure or voltage doubles and there is an increase of 6 dBs. If there is destructive interference, so a signal is deducted from itself or a 180 degrees out of phase signal is added, the result is silence. In other words, a peak added to an equal peak creates a 6 dB larger peak, whereas a peak added to an equal trough creates no output. It nulls. If this is not clear to you, please revisit the video I mentioned earlier. Now, as we've seen, each frequency in the audible spectrum has its own period. That is the time it takes to complete one wave cycle. So this means that if we have a signal and its delayed copy added together, as is the case in comb filtering, the different frequencies will react differently. Let's go straight to an example. To calculate the period of a given frequency in seconds, you just go one divided by that frequency. So uh, for 100 Hertz, you would say one divided by 100 is 0 0.01 seconds. Uh, then to get milliseconds, you go times a thousand, so you just move the comma over to the right three digits. So it's 10 milliseconds. So the period for 100 hertz is 10 milliseconds. Now, if the delay of the two signals that we're looking at is five milliseconds, that's exactly half the period of 100 hertz. And the result is it puts 100 hertz 180 degrees out of phase and it cancels out. Now the period of 200 hertz is 5 milliseconds. So if I have the same delay of 5 milliseconds, the original and the delayed copy will line up perfectly for 200 hertz. And this frequency gets 6 dBs louder. The period of 300 hertz is 3.333 milliseconds. So in my 5 milliseconds delay, this will be 1.5 periods. And again, 300 hertz cancels out just like 100 did. For 400 Hz, the period is 2.5 milliseconds, so two full cycles fit into the 5 milliseconds. And the third cycle of the original perfectly aligns with the first cycle of the delayed version, and so forth. Let's look at this in the computer. Okay, now here you can see my analyzer, and it's going from 40 Hz up to 6 kHz here. And I've created a little sweep, just a sine wave going up and then looping. Sounds like this. All right. And I'm sending this to another channel, so uh, effectively duplicating it. And on that other channel, I've added a five millisecond delay. And when I add that in now, we get the effect of basically comb filtering from a five millisecond delay, starting now. All right, so as you can see, we've got some dips now. There, there, there. 
And if you pay attention, they are where we calculated. The first one at 100 here, bloop. And then at 300, 5, 7, 9, and so forth. So I'm taking the delayed channel out again. And you can also see that when I play just the sine wave, it peaks here at minus 32 dBFS and is the same level. And when the and when I add the delayed version back in, you can see also the peaks are clearly visible because they're going 60 Bs over that original level. Okay, and uh, one other way to look at it, this is some pink noise. So basically there's energy in every frequency here. And um, I'm doing the same thing to it now. I'm sending this to the other channel with the five milliseconds delay and I'm adding that in now. <laughs> and it sounds absolutely dreadful. And uh, what you can clearly see here now is the dip at 100, the dip at 300, five, seven, nine, and so forth. Without the delayed version and with the delayed version. Now this last example clearly shows why it's called comb filtering. The periodic nulls that are created in the signal look like the teeth of a comb. And that's really all there is to that. Okay, now while these examples explained exactly what's going on, they don't help you understand what the problem sounds like at all. So I'll do another example and it sounds like this. Now I've doubled the recording of my voice and delayed it by only one millisecond. Here is the same thing, but now the delay is 10 milliseconds and it sounds absolutely dreadful. This is the same thing with a delay of 20 milliseconds. What a pain! And now with a delay of 50 milliseconds. Once we get to such delays, it starts to sound more like an echo. And, and finally, at 100, 100 milliseconds, it's, it's clearly, clearly an echo. Let's get back to 10 milliseconds, as that was instructively awful. And now let's see what happens when I change one thing. Now, this is suddenly a lot better. What happened? I still have a double of my voice recording with a delay of 10 milliseconds added, but now it's 6 dB softer. Much better. Let's make it 10 dB softer. This would now solve the problem in most cases and is in fact a demonstration of the principle used in the 3 to 1 rule. This rule states that if two microphones are picking up the same source at different distances, the further mic should be at least three times further from the source as the closer mic. This is assuming that the mics have equal sensitivity and gain. This 3 to 1 ratio would result in a level difference of about 10 dBs, which, as we've just demonstrated, is approximately the area where the issue becomes negligible. If you're good at maths, you could now get into the comments and point out that it's really 9.54 dBs. Come on, you know you want to. And by the way, all microphones in a room are, to an extent, picking up all the sources in that room. So please don't ignore the 3 to 1 rule by saying, but this microphone is for a different instrument. It's important to remember that microphones are unaware of their user's intentions. Now comb filtering doesn't always sound horrible. Whenever some funky effect is discovered in audio, artists set about using it creatively, and so the flanger was developed. A flanger adds a delayed signal, usually in the 3 to 20 milliseconds range, and then the delay of that signal is modulated, so the delay is getting larger and smaller. This means that the nulls are now sweeping through the signal, and it sounds like a rocket taking off. Originally, this was done by playing a signal on two time-aligned tape machines simultaneously, and slowing down one or the other by applying gentle pressure to the flange, which is the outer edge of the reel. Imagine the kinds of effort they used to have to go through back in the day, just to create a little bit of swooshing. It must have taken them ages. Audio engineering was hard work, and they had to figure it all out for themselves as best as they could. Luckily, nowadays, you can learn so much just by subscribing to this YouTube channel right now. You really should. You don't live in the audio stone age, and you should take advantage of that. And if you find this video that I've made for you today useful, I would be very happy to read your comments about it below.
All right, so back to vintage flanging. Some great examples of glorious, ridiculous, over-the-top flanging can be heard on Jimi Hendrix's Bold as Love and the Small Faces' Ichiku Park. Some more restrained and expertly executed examples are in Pink Floyd's Echoes and Mr. Blue Sky by the Electric Light Orchestra. Of course, these are the fun moments. The problems with comb filtering that sound more like the speech examples I made earlier can really be the death blow to any hope for a usable sound. Let's look at some examples now where these interferences can occur. First example, two or more microphones are recording the same source at different distances and are then summed together. So you've got a source, there's several microphones involved, the distances and therefore the delays are different, bam, comb filtering. This is the major reason why microphone setups with very few mics will often get the best possible results and may in some cases even be easier to pull off. To use many mics successfully means you have to know very well what you're doing and more is not automatically better. However, using just one microphone does not mean you're now safe from comb filtering because, example two, a single microphone is picking up the sound of a source as well as a delayed reflection from a nearby surface. It's always dangerous to have reflective surfaces very near the microphone or the source for this reason. Let me add in a little extra demonstration here. Uh, you're listening to this microphone up there and I've got a little mirror here. You see, the law of reflection applies to both light and sound, so the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. That means if I can see the mic in my mirror, the mirror should reflect the sound from my face to the microphone as well. Now, of course, my mouth and my eyes aren't in the same place, fortunately, but it's close enough for jazz. Okay, so we should get a little comb filtering from the mirror, and to add to the effect, I'm going to move it up and down to get a bit of flanging going as well. Let's check it out. <laughs> can you hear it? I can certainly hear it in the headphones. And uh, bear in mind that I'm getting this effect from just a small and very thin mirror. So you can imagine that uh, the effect from a solid wall or a solid ceiling will be much greater. Uh, so it's important to keep those well away from your microphones. Another example where comb filtering occurs is a single microphone that is recording a double source as you would get with a 2x12 guitar speaker cabinet. Both speakers are putting out the same signal from slightly different locations. So if the mic is not right in the center between them, comb filtering. A mixing mistake where I see comb filtering happen is two channels of an AB or time difference recording and they are being panned inwards. They have a time difference between them. If you start adding them together, which is what panning is, you get comb filtering. The very slight delay from an ADDA conversion when mixed with the direct signal for whatever reason, which can happen in the studio or just on a pedal board or in a concert PA and broadcast, etc causes some of the very worst instances of comb filtering and makes a signal instantly and utterly unusable. That would be the full-on robot effect I did on my voice earlier. Acoustic comb filtering, on the other hand, is more subtle in comparison and quite common. Let's say you're sitting in a living room on a sofa and there's a stereo home system, but you're not sitting right in the center of the two speakers. Then the sound from the closer speaker will arrive earlier and the further speaker later and etc, etc, comb filtering. Same problem uh, with concert PAs, for example. Comb filtering was also a real challenge in studio control rooms when you had large analog consoles. Uh, and speakers placed on the meter bridge of those consoles because the sound reflecting off of the console mixed with the direct sound again would cause the dreaded comb filtering. So as you can see, it is simply everywhere. Uh, what you have to do is know what it sounds like and understand why it occurs so that you can see if you can change something when it gets too bad. One interesting development that we can observe in the history of recording is that people started with microphones far away and gradually got closer to the sources. Nowadays, many productions will be done with closed mics only. And I mean, really as close as it gets. I could imagine that this development had a lot to do with comb filtering because as we've seen in the speech examples, not only the delay, but also the level plays a crucial role in how bad the effect is.
When you mic very closely, other sources become softer in comparison, so comb filtering is almost never an issue when you slap the mic right onto the source. Of course, for many other reasons, that will not usually, if ever, be the best sounding solution. So in conclusion, lack of understanding of comb filtering is, in my estimation, one of the major reasons for bad sounding recordings. Either because there is actual comb filtering audible, or because the engineers are aware of the bad sound introduced by comb filtering, but the only way they intuitively learn to avoid it is by miking as closely as possible. This, in turn, will cause all sorts of other problems and blandness. Being able to back off without ruining everything is an important step in the art of microphone technique. And I hope today's video gave you some tools on how to do that successfully. All right, that's it for now. Thank you very much for listening. If you have additional questions or your own experiences to share, please do that in the comments. Also feel free to send this video to like-minded recording geeks and follow me here and turn on the notifications so you'll not miss future episodes. Thank you very much. Goodbye.